All right, in this lecture, we're going to be uh, talking about Julia, uh, the programming language. This is a very high level introduction, and we'll follow up with a few more lectures to get into some of the details. So, why Julia? Well, I think most people at the number one on their list is going to be the speed. Julia is very fast. Uh, I have some benchmarks to show on the next slide. Uh, one of the reasons it's fast is it uses something called just in time compilation. So, whenever you write, a function in Julia and then and then register it, uh, that function is uh, immediately compiled into machine code that is uh, fast for the architecture. So uh, Julia has binaries that can run on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And when you write any functions on any of those programs, when you register the function in memory, then it's immediately compiled down to uh, assembly code uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, compilation optimization that occurs during that process, and uh, you know it allows for very performant code on uh, on each computer. And this is different than you know your traditional compiled languages like um, C or Fortran, for example, where you have to do all of the compilation of the entire code base up front. In in Julian, the code is just in time compiled, so essentially every function. Um, just as it's registered uh, is compiled when needed. Uh, and also this is in contrast to runtime or uh, interpreted languages like Python, for example, which uh, the code is not compiled at all. And uh, at runtime, the, the transpiler has to make some decisions about what types of variables are and make a lot of, uh, and all of that is uh, associated with a lot of overhead, okay? Um, however, you don't have to uh, type each variable. So if you're if you've ever used C or Fortran, you know if you define a variable, you have to say up front what the variable is. Like uh, you know x is an integer, or y is a, a double precision floating point number. Uh, you don't have to do that in Julia, but you can. And if you can, it it can speed up some of the just in time compilation processes that occur, and it can also make for safer uh, code. You know code that is type checked. Uh, so that when you when you write it, it's easier to debug and other things because of some of the type checking that occurs. Uh, but you don't have to, and so it is a it is a dynamic language. You don't have to specify the types if you don't want to. Um, it's very composable because of something a programming paradigm called multiple dispatch, which I have more on later. Um, but it has some similarities with polymorphism from object oriented programming languages. Uh, but I would argue that in many cases, uh, the multiple dispatch paradigm actually allows for even more composability, meaning you can take lots of libraries and kind of put them together to quickly write uh, code that can do very complex things. Uh, it's general purpose. So, you know, I think Julia was originally intended to be a replacement for, for MATLAB or one of these type of uh, engineering scientific languages. And very much a uh, lo large part of the audience is the scientific programming computer, uh, community. However, uh, you can do general purpose programming things. It, it has you know everything that you'd need to build, any kind of microservices application. It has a package manager uh, built into it, which is a, another kind of nice highlight over a language like Python or, or many others that don't even have uh, package managers. Um, so it's very general purpose. You could use it for system admin tasks, you can use it for web scra scraping, um, there's, you know, and of course, scientific programming. Uh, it's open source, uh, you know, like Python and many other languages. Uh, you, can, you can see all the source code, you can develop it, it's developed on GitHub, uh, all of those things. The uh, amount of packages are not quite at par with uh, the Python world. However, it, it's rapidly evolving, and there are some really amazing packages out there. For one, uh, differentialequations.jl is an example. Uh, in my opinion, this is the finest differential equation solving suite of, of any programming language. It, it, you know, it beats out uh, many, of the, many of the legacy Fortran and C solvers that have been around a long, long time uh, in benchmarks and, and uh, has great uh, tooling for uh, stiff, uh, stiff equations, stiff ODEs, and automatic switching, and uh, for, for stiff and non-stiff equations, and many other things. I also mentioned Flux there. there there's many, many, there's thousands of packages at this point. Um, Flux is a, is a neural network library that would be kind of a, a competitor to, you know, TensorFlow or PyTorch or something like that. And uh, the community is growing, right? So it's it's not as large as Python, of course. 
but it is growing and I found it to be quite helpful. Uh, here's a link to the Slack workspace where you can join uh, and ask questions on. Uh, there's also Discourse and other places where you can ask questions, GitHub issues. So uh, returning to the question of how fast, a little bit hard to see these dots here, but uh, in this case, everything is normalized to the C language being, uh, one, you know, uh, on the order of one, right? So, so all of all of these benchmarks, um, you know, matrix multiplied, computing matrix statistics, parsing integers, printing to file, uh, Fibonacci recursion, sorting, um, the Mandelbrot set. So they've all been normalized to C, where C, you know, a, a good C implement, implementation. Many people would say these would be you know, about as fast as you write, you could possibly write uh, any code. And you'll see that in in many cases, or in, at least in one or two cases, the Julia code is, is actually faster than the C code. And this this mainly uh, is, is probably that the this C implementation of this Mandelbrot set is not as uh, optimized as it could be. Uh, and Julia's just-in-time compilation process optimizes the code in a way that it, it actually can beat C. But in all the other cases, you can see it's it's all you know it's on the same order of magnitude uh, as C, uh, you know, just a multiple or two different in in most cases. And you can see most of the other programming languages. Uh, Lua also does very well, but this is not a programming language that many people uh, use for scientific computing. Rust and Go are kind of two new languages on the scene. Uh, very good languages, but uh, they're compiled languages. And uh, so it just takes a little bit more development time. And, and also the, the software stack or packages available for scientific programming, data science, um, they're not as vast uh, in Rust and Go as they are in, in, in Julia or you know, other languages. So uh, of course, you know, Fortran, Java, JavaScript, MATLAB is a popular engineering science language, Mathematica, Python, you can see how they all perform here uh, on these different applications. So, you know, I think in, in most cases, uh, when you count development time uh, plus runtime, uh, Julia is probably going to be the fastest language you can use. So, uh, you know, and C uh, is very fast, but uh, it's not very forgiving uh, to programmers. It's easy to have memory leaks and, and other things, and the, the development time in C uh, can, can uh, you know, will be several multiples longer than, than Julia in most cases. So I have a simple um, example here of what, what multiple dispatch is. Again, this is, has some similarities with polymorphism and ob object-oriented programming. So if you're familiar with that, uh, it's this idea that you can have functions of the same name, but that perform differently depending on the types of things they're operating on. So these types are usually associated with the objects uh, in an object-oriented programming language. Um, but here, here you, you don't have to associate them with any kind of objects. So in this case, a very simple starting example, uh, we have a function uh, just called my add that in this case, uh, I do, you know, again, we don't have to write these functions with types, but in this case, um, I, I go ahead and type annotate them so that I have, you know, in, in both cases, they take two arguments, X and Y, and they just simply uh, return the, the addition of those two things. And in this case, uh, in one, they operate on integers, and in one, they operate on floats. Uh, so, um, you know, in this case, I can call the function 1 plus 2, and I get the integer 3 back, or 1.0, 2.0, and I get the in integer 3 back. I mean, the, the floating point number 3 back, okay? Uh, one thing you'll note is if I were to, say, try to add a real number to, a, to an integer, uh, in this case, I'm going to get an error because there is no my add function that adds a float to an integer. So that has to be defined. And, and of course, if I wouldn't have type annotated these, um, there, there, you know, uh, there was options, just the, the plus, the normal plus operator here knows how to do some type converting and other things um, that would allow me to get this to work. But, uh, it, you know, in this case, it just uh, doesn't work because I didn't define my add for any type of variable that, uh, adds a float to an integer, okay? So, but that's not all that interesting, but for example, what if we wanted to do something like this, right? So what does it mean to add two strings together? Well, we're gonna define that. We're gonna define that operation. So, you know, this is again, my addition of two strings, and what I want, you know, my addition of two strings to be 
is to take the, the, the string X and the string Y and just simply interpolate them into one string. So concatenate them into one string with a space in between, right? So if I define that function, um, you know, again, it's the same name as the other ones, the ones that, that added integers and floats. So now I define uh, the function my add and I give it two arguments that are strings, hello world. And again, I get the, the hello world uh, with a space in between, uh, just like that. Now we could also uh, go ahead and overload an operator. So say we wanted to have a, a plus operator that added two things together, uh, two strings together. Like uh, if you're familiar with Python, you can add strings with the plus operator. Well, we can, uh, it's not implemented by default in Julia, but we can go ahead and um, create that behavior by overloading the plus operator. So here we define a function that overloads the plus operator and takes two strings, X and Y, and then we just pass X and Y into the function I defined before, my add, which is going to uh, concatenate the strings with the space in between. And then with that, we can see if we run it, uh, we get, you know, if, so we say hello plus world, then we in fact do get uh, what we'd expect. Um, so a little bit more interesting, but you know, the next step then would be that we can define our own types. So in this case, I have an example where uh, I define a composite type so we'll call it point, and it will have two fields, X and Y. And it's not always a good idea for performance to, uh, when you build composite types, to um, hard code the types uh, as, you know, in this case I've done here, but um, we won't worry about that right now. We're not really worried about performance. Um, so I'm just trying to, in this case, I'm just trying to demonstrate uh, the idea here. So again, we're going to define a function my add. And this time, uh, the, my ad's going to take two points, so a point A and a point B, and it will return a point where the fields themselves, the individual fields, have been added. Right. So, uh, if I have a, if I take a, the x field of A and the, and the x field of B, and add them together, along with the uh, y field of A and the y field of B, uh, and and so then we can run run the, this code just like this. So again. My add same name uh, as a function that we had to that would add strings together, that would add integers together, and that would add floating point numbers together. In this case, we define two points. Um, you know, in this case, uh, our points will just be the, the same. You know, one for the x field, two for the y field. But you can see when we add them together, we pass them as arguments into my add. Uh, then what is returned is again what we'd expect, right? The the X fields have been added together along with the Y fields. So this is a, just a very high level example of multiple dispatch. We'll see more of that uh, in examples uh, coming up, but also uh, even in this example here where we talk about generic programming. So uh, this is kind of just taking this idea of multiple dispatch and, and, and taking it a little bit further. So what we have here is there's a package in Julia called measurements, which allows you, it defines an algebra uh, for numbers with uncertainties, right? So, so here we have a number X and a number Y, and these are assumed to be standard deviations. So this is 5.23 plus or minus 0.14 uh, standard deviations, and this is 45.77 plus or minus 0.1 standard deviations. And there's an algebra defined on this. So like all the, you know, uh, add, subtract, multiply, divide, all of those things are defined on these measurements. And so if I just simply add X and Y, then I get uh, you know, th this, this uh, behavior here, and, and all the algebra is, is consistent. Well, the, the neat thing about this is I can combine this uh, with a differential equations package, for example, because it was programmed in a way that allowed for generic typing, and it, it actually gives me something very, very powerful. So let's see what happens here. We're gonna, what we want to do is we're going to solve this equation, right? This is this, just the uh, equation of motion for a pendulum with angle theta, with a with a small um, uh, with for sm with small angles, okay. And so what we're going to do is we load load some uh, packages here, differential equations, measurements, and plots, and we're going to define uh, the gravitational constant uh, to have a small error, along with the length to have a, a possibly a small measurement error, and uh, additionally the the initial conditions. So the, the initial conditions. Uh, for the, the initial speed 
uh, well, I'm sorry, the, the speed, the initial velocity will be zero, but the initial um, angle will, will, will be uh, pi divided by 60 plus or minus 0 0.01 standard deviations of that. And we're going to run this uh, for a time span of 6.3 seconds. We define the equations here in a function and then pass that function into uh, this ODE problem. And, and you know, don't worry about the syntax. We'll, we'll cover that when we cover differential equations.jl. But uh, we're going to pass the function in along with the initial conditions and the time span and then solve it. And the nice thing is you notice, I mean, all we did was define the types to be these measurement types up here. Uh, at the beginning, and what happens is that when I pass that through the differential equation solver, I automatically get back, and not even just the differential equation solver, but also the plotting routines, under, understand these measurement types. And so when I pass, when I uh, run this, solve it, and plot it, what you see here is uh, the the red line is the analytic solution. Of course, we know that a pendulum is small angle; it's just going to swing back and forth in a sinusoid fashion. But what you see here are error bars associated with the solution right and again you know this so we actually got uncertainty quantification through the solution of the differential equation just by using these measurement types and and again uh, you know we didn't have to do these packages were developed completely independently so so measurements was developed uh completely independently of differential equations but because differential equations dot jl uses this generic programming uh, with respect to the type system, it can easily handle these measurement types and they're just passed in and, and, and the solution is solved and you can see how the error propagates. Uh, and I just think this is really neat. So it's kind of a very high level uh, overview of the you know types of things that you can do in Julia. And uh, we're going to get into more specifics in the lectures to come.